Welcome to the Clear to Send podcast, a podcast about wireless engineering, where we educate you on Wi-Fi technology, talk about design tips, troubleshooting, interviews, and the tools. Here are your hosts, Roel and Francois. This show is happily sponsored by Metageek. Wi-Fi is awesome when it works, but when it doesn't, the problem is usually a mystery. Unless you have Insider Office by Metageek. Insider Office quickly scans your wireless environment and recommends ideal channel selection to help you make your Wi-Fi awesome and keep it that way. Check out the solutions at medigeek.com to get started and get your Wi-Fi working the way you want it to. Hey everyone, thank you for listening to a brand new episode of the Clear to Send podcast. In this episode, we have an interview with Andrew Vanaj and a couple of engineers from Ubiquity Networks. And they're going to talk about uh, their collaboration together in the new capacity planner and also in designing for the FedEx forum for high density and capacity. Now, this is going to be kind of a long episode, so I just want to skip right to it and have you guys listen to it because I think it's a great episode. So once again, thank you guys for listening and I hope you guys have a great week. Hey everybody, welcome to a brand new episode of the Clear to Send podcast. This is going to be an exciting episode because we have a group of people today. Um, and and so we're going to talk about Ubiquity, um, Revolution Wi-Fi Capacity Planner, and the FedEx Forum, uh, high density deployment. But before we talk about that, I want to introduce who we have here on the show. And of course, I have my co-host, Francois. How are you, Francois? I'm very good. Good morning. Excited about this one. Yeah. Excited to hear about Andrew and the other guys from Ubiquiti. Yeah. So like Francois said, we also have Andrew Vanaj. If you guys don't know him, he is the creator of the Capacity Planner and he is the blogger at revolutionwifi.net, I believe. Yes, that's correct. How are you doing, Andrew? Doing great. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, it's uh, finally great to have you on. I think you were on my list for the longest time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited to be here, and especially with uh, the topics we have on tap and, and the ubiquity folks we have on the call, on the call as well. Yeah, awesome. And so, with uh, coming from ubiquity, we have Brandon Gillis. Did I say that right? That's right. All right, got it. And Jeff Hansen. Can you guys uh, introduce yourselves and uh, what you guys do at ubiquity? Sure. Uh, so again, my name's Brandon. Uh, I'd lead the Unify team. Uh, so it's my role to make sure we're going in the right direction on the hardware products we're making, uh, firmware uh, implementations, new features, um, every everything from uh, concept all the way to getting it to market. Awesome. And Jeff? And uh, yeah, I'm Jeff Hansen. I'm the, the firmware lead for the Unified team. So I uh, I oversee all the everything that goes into the source code. Uh, so I do a lot of code reviews, um, making sure that everything goes in is kosher and do set up a lot of testing and um, uh, help with the QA teams and, and uh, make sure that our software is, is running smoothly for, for everything, fixing security issues, fixing uh, bugs, performance issues, uh, all of that kind of falls under what I do. All right. So you're the guy that, that people go to. <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah, not just a ubiquity but uh got lots of family and always helping out <laughs> awesome well we wanted to start off this discussion about the collaboration between andrew slash revolution wi-fi and ubiquity on the new capacity planner andrew do you want to talk about that and and kick that off sure um so capacity planner was released uh, what two two years ago or so two and a half years ago um for free to the community just as kind of a you know garage hobby project um for myself to uh, do a couple of things it was to you know help educate the community on um capacity topics with and capacity planning in a wireless network which i think is has been very immature uh and just you know bring awareness to that topic and then um Second to it, you know, help improve wireless networks, uh, help administrators improve their own wireless networks or build better wireless networks. Um, because I think as an industry, um, talk to any of the, the community members or the professionals in the field and, and we see, 
hands down more bad Wi-Fi networks than we see good. And, and there's various reasons for that. But I think a lot of it has to do just with the, uh, the grassroots um, approachability of Wi-Fi. Anybody can deploy it. And, and getting you know, expertise into everyone's hands and, and minds is um, you know, a difficult challenge, to say the least. So Capacity Planner was released really just to help move the industry forward and bring awareness to a topic that I think wasn't gaining a lot of uh, steam or a lot of um, uh, visibility. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with 802.11n that came out in 2008, 2009, um, we just saw this tremendous growth, uh, as well as with, you know, mobile devices and the whole iPhone era that that spawned. Um, just tremendous amounts of growth on our networks. And and I saw all sorts of different rules of thumb being used in the in the, in the industry, like number of APs per square footage, which is fundamentally a coverage type of uh, uh, metric and doesn't really match well to capacity. We saw number uh, rules of thumb on number of users per AP, which again is completely doesn't even involve the context of how it's being deployed or how it's being used. So I really wanted to try, try to just you know figure out for myself how to you know plan for capacity better and then share that with the community. Um, so that's kind of the background. And recently, I, um, I partnered with Ubiquity and we released version two of the tool. And uh, some of the enhancements that that brings are, um, you know, the first tool was really, uh, you know, kind of a, a geeky mathematics type of tool where, you know, uh, it showed you a lot of the raw data, but it wasn't very easily digestible um, unless you were really into that kind of thing and, and really an analytics geek. Um Version two, uh, what I've tried to do is bring that more to the everyday administrator or network, um, you know, operator, so that they could have uh, visual analysis and graphs, so they could better understand from a visual representation how capacity is being used and where improvements can be made, um, and help communicate that up to management to, you know, lobby or um, um, persuade management to to make needed investments or changes that, that they they felt were necessary. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of the analysis and graphs really help draw out things like, hey, what's the impact of different types of clients on your network? Um, are legacy clients causing a certain impact on your network? And you can very easily digest that. For instance, you know, some of the things when I started um, looking at it myself were like, hey, if I have uh, legacy 802.11 uh, A or H11 G clients on my network, uh, how do they use capacity different than a, a more modern 11N or 11AC and um, MIMO capable device? Um, for instance, they may they may only be taking up you know fifteen uh, percent of your overall throughput on the network, but they require forty or fifty percent of your radios to to achieve that. And it can vary. You know, it, you can start drawing those very concrete details out and saying, "Wow, that's." really causing um, you know most of the spend on our network. If we could make these changes, we could really improve the capacity or maybe lo- uh, reduce our operating expenses. So those are some of the, th- the things with the analysis graphs that I wanted to to bring to every everyone in the community. Um, the second big uh, update in version two is mesh planning, um, really to help draw out. Uh, there's a lot of mesh solutions on the network today, um, and, and a lot of them that users consider are really just what we call single channel mesh. They're built into the access points that also serve clients. And really, they use one 5 gigahertz channel for the entire mesh um, for uh, for reliability and extension of the network where you can't really pull wires, um, as opposed to, let's say, other dedicated mesh systems, which are not included in, the, in my tool that can do frequency separation on upstream and downstream links hmm. and things like that. Um, so I wanted to, to bring in some mesh planning mainly on the education side, so people would see how, uh, how, how much of a performance hit you take when you uh, are, are actually deploying mesh. Um, better, better visibility into AP load and room for growth. I think you know, that's a, just kind of a table stakes. If you're a network administrator, you need to know what you're using, what threshold, uh, when you hit a threshold, when do you need to start planning for growth and things like that. So brought better visibility into the tool for that. And then also brought in some 11 AC Wave 2 enhancements, um, particularly for 160 megahertz channel support, uh, dual 5 gigahertz deployments, since we're seeing some uh, manufacturers deploy those now. Um, about the only thing I don't have in there right now for Wave 2 is MU MIMO capability. Um, I feel it's best to plan um, for single user MIMO. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you get the benefit of any MU MIMO clients, it's above and beyond. It's kind of like 
um, icing on the cake of, hey, yeah. I didn't plan for this. I want to plan without it. Um, but if I get any net benefit from MU, MU MIMO, it, it's gravy. Cool. Um, so those are kind of the, the features um, in the new tool. Uh, any questions on that? Uh, otherwise, I could you know transition no, over yeah. into how I you you know work with Ubiquity. Well, to say that you started this as a hobby, I think, is an understatement. Because <laughs> I think you put a lot of work into it, and and I know I've used it several times for my deployments just to get an understanding of how many uh, APs I'm going to need for my capacity planning. Because that's what I primarily use it for. But maybe you can. Um, let people know what it doesn't do like this tool will it do everything for them or what is was it what is it that they need to know about capacity <laughs> planner that that they're missing it is the magic wand to make all your wi-fi problems go no i'm just joking um, <laughs> uh no harry potter references here um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just like any other tool. You use it uh, appropriately, and you know what you're doing. A good data in, good data out. You can get some uh, pretty accurate results, and and I think um, we've proven that. Uh, I've proven that with several of my own deployments, as well as working with some other people who have used it and and baselined it, and and kind of proven that like. You know, it, it, the tool can get pretty granular if you wanted to about, you know, what types of devices and what uh, throughput SLAs or applications you're using. But you don't really need to go to that level of depth. That's just really, you know, kind of my inner uh, geek and, and uh, oh, I, I'm a planner. So I, I love to do everything to the, you know, well yeah. beyond what, what reasonable what would be reasonable. Mm -hmm. So for most people, they could just simply go in and, and I say, you know, you can knock out and get 90% accuracy if you just put in the mix of client devices between broad classes of clients, like uh, two versus three stream laptops, uh, what are our tablets, uh, especially like older versus newer, because like, you know, if you have really old uh, one stream tablets, like that old iPad, original iPad mini versus the newer ones, you know, just put in broad classes of two versus three stream laptops, one versus two stream tablets, and maybe one versus two stream smartphones and put in reasonable SLAs of what's a good user experience on this device. I don't need to know what applications are running, but I know that people use those devices differently. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're doing file sharing or heavy CAD work or some intense collaborative sessions that some some people do on, on like laptop type devices, that's going to be a higher, you know, throughput SLA than what somebody's going to be doing on a smartphone or a tablet. Okay. So, you know, just rough guidelines. I usually tell people, hey, break out your laptops, tablets, and smartphones, and then break down a decent SLA for each one for a good generic user experience. And I usually use like maybe five megabits per second um, of guaranteed throughput for a laptop. If you're in a heavy use environment, maybe 10 megabits. Mm -hmm. A tablet, uh, between two and four megabits, depending on if you're doing HD video streaming or not. Uh, that's the one I tend to see more often than not because I tend I work in education right now. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, for smartphones, I mean, if you're in uh, a typical environment, you know, what's good for web surfing and, and casual checking of email and, and social media? Maybe it's 500K to one megabit. Um, same for a, a high density deployment. Um, and so then knowing your client mix is like, that's the biggest part of the problem. Because uh, going into an all laptop environment versus a high density environment that's all smartphones is completely different. And as long as you can understand the generic client mix in your environment, you can get reasonably accurate um, with, with what you need to achieve. Okay. I think that's a good transition then to talk about the partnership that you have with Ubiquity because they they did do their deployment at the FedEx forum. Uh, maybe talk do that introduction of, of how that came to be. How did that form? And you know why did why why is there this partnership between you and Ubiquity? Yeah, so I wasn't involved in the FedEx forum. I'll let the Ubiquity team um, talk about that. Uh, but I, I do know we did have a common um, a, a professional acquaintance that that worked with them on on the FedEx forum and also uh, worked with me on on the capacity planner and was used in that project. Um, and and he kind of brought us together. Um, so Daryl DeRoja, if you're out there listening, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for um, using the tool and uh, and and everything you do in the community. Um, so the the reason that I was really excited to partner with Ubiquity is um, Ubiquity number one has a tremendous uh, customer base and and reach. Um, they provide um, you know I think uh, fairly fairly or unfairly you know. Um, 
some some people in the community look at SMB Wi-Fi and and kind of snub their noses at it. Of, of you know, we're we've got these enterprise class solutions out here, but Ubiquity is really tackling a huge market need that is is one of the primary needs within the Wi-Fi industry, and that is the SMB, the you know the people that are not Wi-Fi experts out there, but are deploying Wi-Fi, and these businesses have a really critical need for Wi-Fi, mm-hmm. um, and you know. I, I don't want to speak for Ubiquity, but it seems like you know, now they're pushing uh, up up market as well, getting more sophisticated, which I think we see with the, the FedEx Forum and what they'll talk through with all the sophistication they got into that deployment and, and in their solution to handle that. Um, but Ubiquity has a huge customer reach. Though That customer segment um, of not Wi-Fi experts, but the everyday admin really is – they need education and they need simple tools – to, to really help them deploy good networks. And I think that's a huge, huge aspect to tackle in the industry. And we'd be doing a disservice if we didn't. So I'm really excited to partner with them about that for education and, and, and customer outreach to get, you know, better Wi-Fi networks out there in all deployments. And there are actually two parts of the collaboration. Um, they're sponsoring version two of the tool, which, you know, I'm not a developer, so it's only in Excel, which kind of, you know, frankly sucks, but it is what it is. Um, and uh, and piggybacking on that, Ubiquity wants to work with me, and we're we are working on a, a development of a web-based tool. Awesome, um, nice. So yeah. I think that'll be really cool to expand its reach even further. Yeah, because I, I know Ubiquity free, right? has great great graphical tools. But yeah, uh, to Francois's question, is it still going to be free to users? <laughs> yeah, that's right. It'll be free. Awesome, nice. cool. Yeah, that's yes. great. Uh, so to um, to Andrew's point on education, uh, I come from RF engineering, um, and t- taking even an RF engineer who's you know studied a lot about airtime and um, MCS rates and antennas and cell propagation and all that, uh, when when you tell them about Wi-Fi and how Wi-Fi works and how you actually do capacity planning on Wi-Fi, uh, it can be even kind of a painful conversation to just using words to explain to these guys where this is like their bread and butter, right? This is what they study of like, how do you do Wi-Fi planning properly and, you know, your, um, your power tapers and then uh, the capacity of the device uh, impacts the airtime that's being utilized and that all flows to your system capacity and, and you have to plan for all these things. Um, and so the reason Andrew's tool is is so valuable, I think, is even explaining to these guys who are just directly into the industry and, you know, they're in college for this, it can be a painful conversation. Um, so explaining this to the general population, how to do Wi-Fi planning uh, properly is is a really difficult subject. Uh, and so that's why from ubiquity standpoint, um, it's such a valuable tool because like Andrew was pointing out, it, it, it shows you what matters. So if you just put someone in front of the tool and they're willing to use it, uh, they can really learn, you know, what matters on doing Wi-Fi deployments. Uh, and now of course it doesn't cover everything cause no tool can, and there's some, uh, training that, you know, should be done around it for sure. But it gives us a big leg up in terms of educating our market share on how you actually deploy Wi-Fi, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then in the FedEx form, it's uh, incredibly useful for us as, as a sanity check, right? So, uh, like Andrew said, when you're, uh, trying to understand what's going on and what you should attack, um, this tool lets you kind of like come back to reality and say, okay, what capacity are we really shooting for here? Given that the type of clients that we're going to have, what should our channel utilization be if we're doing everything right? Um, and, uh, for tuning in the deployment. So it allows you to set things like, um, your, uh, minimum rates and how that impacts airtime utilization. So you can kick off those, those slower clients that really will bog down the network. Uh, and so we use that, uh, pretty extensively when we were going through the forum and making a push to, to optimize things. Uh, so while we're uh, tuning cell size, which affects rates, and then we're also tuning, uh, minimum rates themselves. Uh, and it helped us, like I said, to, to really give us a sanity check of like, okay, what should we be pushing for? What is the next step to really have a big impact to make sure that we're not, you know, chasing our tails and, and optimizing this. And Andrew said, uh, said it very well once that there's kind of an ocean of things that you can attack when you're doing a high density deployment and the, the tool really helps you, uh, know what are the most important things you should attack first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Could, and go, go ahead, Andrew. I was going to say, uh, piggyback on top of that, I mean, one of the other things that is very well known in the industry is, you know, um, capacity and frequency reuse are, are very tightly 
coupled together. And so, you know, the way I like to talk about it is two sides of the same coin of airtime usage within a cell uh, and airtime usage uh, or shared uh, across cells. And so, um, you know, what I tried to do with version two as well was expose more um, frequency reuse requirements. So if you've developed a capacity plan, it very clearly states, you know, hey, you're looking at trying to reuse channels in this environment, you know, uh, three or four times uh, in order to get this capacity out. And if you go into an environment and say, well, there's no way I can get more than two uh, two channel reuses out of this in this environment, then immediately, you know, you've got to start, you know, scaling back your expectations or requirements on, on capacity in order to try to get to a reasonable uh, level. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, can can someone from Ubiquity then transition us to okay? We got you've got this new um, the, the FedEx forum that you've got to plan for, and of course you you know in the beginning you you launch up capacity planner and kind of set your expectations there with uh, designing for capacity. Can can you guys go into how that plan started and and what like how do you approach such a large project like this? Yeah, so I mean, Daryl was the main one that, that worked with Andrew with uh, Rev- Revolution Wi-Fi, you know, capacity planner, and uh, kind of figured out, you know, the capacity, the what what was possible in the FedEx forum, and um, after plugging in all the numbers, uh, we kind of figured out, I think it's uh, eighty eighty six or uh, so APs in the main bowl area that that we put in there, and uh, he, he was able to figure out, you know, just kind of a sanity check that. Based on all the parameters, uh, luckily we're we're in 2017, so we have, you know, a lot more two-stream uh, cell phones out there, and uh, just kind of plugging in the numbers and figured out if it was, you know, even feasible to pull this off. And so after figuring out that, uh, you know, the numbers did fit, things would work out. Then we started with the channel plan, and uh, so as far as the channel plan goes, um, uh, we made a large matrix spreadsheet and kind of. Um, uh, we put all, all of the channels in there and, uh, Daryl did a lot of, you know, site survey trying to figure out, you know, what, what areas could hear other areas. So like the, the upper bowl, for example, couldn't hear the, the lower bowl. And so, uh, he started mapping out the channel plan based on, on that. And, uh, the way we did the channel plan, uh, was, was based on that. Um, and it kind of, it told us some things that we need to, to look at as far as capacity planning and channel planning uh, in Unify. And so there are a lot of different things that we learned and a lot of uh, really exciting up and coming features that we're planning on adding to Unify um, that will help uh, integrators you know, be able to automatically determine a channel plan. Um, for example, you know, uh, you, know you, you can set up all of your APs and uh, they can start beaconing and and you can uh, tell them to to report on whether they hear each other. Mm-hmm. And so we're adding that to the map where, you, you know, maybe you click on an AP and th- this is all, you know, up and coming, but maybe you click on an AP and it tells you what other APs are, are within range of that AP. And so using that, um, we have some other algorithms that we're pulling as well um, that, that kind of help you develop a channel plan automatically. Um, whereas a lot of the stuff that we did in the FedEx forum, you know, it was a lot more manual Manual, yeah. and, uh, you know, there was a lot of hand holding and <laughs> I mean, just looking over numbers and seeing if, if, uh, the same channel was used too many times and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, the, the hope is, and the goal is that, uh, Unify will be able to give you a channel plan based on your map and, and based on, you know, actual site survey from the APs themselves, um, to, to figure out the channel plan more efficiently. Now I know Daryl did most of the site surveys. Did, do you know how he did the site surveys? Did he, did he do like an AP on a stick with one of the ubiquity APs and was able to, um, you know, put one in the, the, the bowl area and then one in another area to, is that how he was testing, testing whether or not the APs can hear each other? Um, I don't know the exact uh, yeah. tools that he used. Um, I know he used uh, site surveys, and I I, I don't. Uh, he yeah, didn't he used a, I think he used a variety actually. And at one point, yeah, there were several. Um, so we have our ACHD, which is our higher end four by four UMIMO AP, and I know um, we were able to hook that in station mode um, to one of the site site survey tools. Um, 
so that's of course the highest capability ap and then we could tune the data down off of that so i know that was used at one point uh, but i think we used in short all of the tools okay. um so there was you know cell phone tools being used at times there were uh you know macbook pros um hooked to these kind of expensive site survey tools um and in speaking to those tools um that's a lot of what we're working with now uh, and a lot of the reason for this collaboration with andrew is to get those sort of things directly and unify um so the one thing that Andrew's tool does very well is it gives you an idea of what is actually your AP capacity going to be. Um, and it has a lot of things that feed into, okay, here is the actual capacity and throughput based on your devices and your channel plan and your reuse and all of that. And it shows you what the capacity is going to be. Uh, so that's one of the features that we're integrating directly into Unify uh, is to show you this histogram of your capacity plan um, uh, across your APs. So if you can imagine this histogram that shows you, okay, you have, you know, two APs that, and this wouldn't be good that, you know, are less than 18 megabit per second throughput. And then you go across the histogram and you see, okay, there's, you know, 15 APs that are uh, less than 80 megabit per second throughput, right? And then you can play with your channel plan and you can make these changes in the system based on its measurements between the APs um, and the signal power and all this stuff. And then actually some machine learning um, in the back background uh, can get uh, about the system under test can actually continue to produce this histogram so as you manually tweak or as you work with and we'll talk to this a little bit later in the question and answer as you work with our um the machine intelligence that can help you uh, plan your channels which is coming down the line as well uh, you can see this histogram which is really your overall performance of the network you can see your worst performing ap's in terms of capacity and your best performing ap's mm -hmm. Um, and then you can just look at the average of that as well. And you're seeing the distribution too. So in some cases, maybe that average stays the same, but it's actually a lot worse because you've got a bunch of really high performing APs and a bunch of really low performing APs. And so that's, that's not a good solution. And then you can tweak with your channel plan and, and see the actual capacity distribution across your network. Uh, so I think that's going to be super useful. And it's in the exact spirit of, of what Andrew has done here. Uh, and then you get to see it real time uh, about your actual network. So it kind of connects this from the planning stage to the evaluation of, you know, how are you actually doing on your network stage? Do you have a so question, which, Francois? Which model, yeah, I had a question. Which model of access point and uh, which type of antenna do you use for the, uh, the, the FedEx or ROM? Great question. Um, so the answer to that question will change um, later this year as well. Um, okay. so we used, uh, actually it's, it's our $99, uh, MSRP, it's a UAP ACM. So it's a, it's a dual band two by two, uh, connectorized AP. Uh, and then that's hooked to a variety of, uh, directional antennas, um, because of the mount points in the, in the forum change. Um, so your height to the user users, sorry, uh, changes. Um, so then you end up with these different directionalities to, um, ensure that you are still covering uh, approximately the same amount of users per AP. Um, and so, so that's what we used, a variety of off-the-shelf um, directional antennas, I think ranging from maybe 12 dBi to 19 dBi in these. Uh, it's the Unify Mesh series, which can, of course, in this case, is hardwired. Um, so it's the UAP ACM is the model number. Okay. So is it antennas from Ubiquiti or is it third parties antennas? Uh, in this case, it was third party, yeah. Interesting. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, I didn't even know you guys could hook in external antennas. Yeah, uh, and we're actually coming out. We have our own um, external antenna for that as well, directional. It's about, I think, 14 uh, dBi and 5 gigahertz, and maybe 8 and 2.4 gigahertz. And we're waiting on um, uh, a small certification on that one. I forgot the technical name for it, but it should be out relatively soon. Uh, and then for the future answer for the FedEx forum and then for stadiums, we're working on a, a stadium specific product, um, which is a much higher capacity and, and solves a lot of the pains that we've seen in the forum. And then actually we've, we've sponsored a couple other um, stadiums that uh, whenever there's a stadium next to our office, we like to get into it uh, because then we can, uh, you know, the engineering team can have direct access to a stadium. Stadium likes it because they get great Wi-Fi. And we get to learn a bunch of stuff because um, each stadium is different on its constraints. So from all these stadium experiences, um, we've seen the pain points uh, from physical installed channel planning uh, to firmware features to software features. Uh, at the firmware and software features, we've put a lot of work into already. 
Um, and then the, the pain points on the physical install, we've, we put a lot of thought into how do we make this less painful? Uh, so in the FedEx forum and, and several others, uh, one of the painful points was you decide on the, the directivity of your antennas, you go and mount something, and then you realize um, the stadium changed in, in some regard. So that plan doesn't work anymore. You have you know all of these 12 dBi antennas, and now you need 15 or 20 dBi antennas. Um, so the future of stadium Wi-Fi, at least uh, as, as Unify sees it, um, is uh, kind of this, this smart antenna system. So it's a product we're working on that allows you to actually have in one product um, a range from uh, a cell size commensurate. So think of like the, the beam width increasing when you're lower gain and decreasing when you're higher gain. Uh, so from 8 dBi all the way up to 17 dBi, um, in a single product, all uh, software controllable. Uh, and then to combine this with a really high-end, high-capability, multi-radio, multi-five gigahertz solution. Uh, so that's kind of the answer in the future of what will be in the FedEx forum and, and wow. how you deploy, deploy Unify. Uh, and again, the whole point of this is if you have this controllable uh, cell size at RF, um, mm -hmm. then you can go put this antenna up. And with 8 dBi, you can actually be quite close to your users and with 17 dbi uh, you can be significantly further away so it kind of turns into this swiss army knife um and we're using the highest end and many of the highest end radios on the market uh so the idea is uh you can reduce your um install costs and the logistical pains that you have say if you're planning on 50 users per ap um it's a multi-radio solution so you can realistically have say 300 active users on this ap uh, an association limit of 1500. Uh, so the, the overall idea is uh, all the pain that we saw make a solution. So this could be a lot easier, um, uh, just, just even in terms of wiring to install. So how many channels did you use? I'm guessing you guys designed for the five gig. Um, how many channels did you use and were you able to get channel reuse? Like, do you have stats, uh, from, you know, events that you get had at the, at the center, at the forum? that able to, you know, show you that you were able to reuse the channels? Great question. Um, so we needed a channel reuse of around, so if, if we did channel reuse perfectly in the forum, uh, we would have um, had to reuse the channels, I believe, three times, uh, really okay. close to three times. Um, and we used essentially all of the five gigahertz channels uh, and then you know, used the incompatible ones more lightly, of course, uh, which loaded the compatible ones a bit more. Um, and I think we ended up in a, an actual reuse of about 1.8. So that just plays your capacity, mm -hmm. um, the, the total throughput. Uh, we uh, put an effort into trying to, after we got the system working well, we put an effort uh, into trying to get more and more users on. So we actually went through and distributed like Wi-Fi cards and all the seats to try to get everyone to associate at the same time at the beginning of the game and all this stuff. Um, and we ended up with a peak of, I think, about 4,000 users on the network, um, which seems to track with our observations of 4,000 concurrent users uh, with our obs observation of like how many people are going to get on the Wi-Fi at the same mm -hmm. time, like what your uptake rate is. And we had about uh, a gigabit per second um, at that peak. Um, so that's the best we got to. Uh, the limiting factors uh, were uh, channel reuse, I think. Uh, and I guess I should say, you know, that's the best we got to, but we were actually pretty pleased with that. Um, so 4,000 users, gigabit per second, channel reuse, I think, of around 1.8. Uh, the channel reuse um, is just a little limited by the geometry of the devices. And that's something, again, Andrew's tool is really good at pointing out, is that, you know, your devices have a big impact on your network. You can't just choose a great AP and then say your network's going to work great because the, the devices, both on the RF perspective, kind of spewing out noise that gets to other APs uh, and then also just using airtime because they might be slow. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the geometry of the bowls resulted in the devices actually contributing a lot of on-channel noise to other APs, uh, despite the AP design itself actually not interfering with each other much. Um, so if you could you know, magically... Uh, only use you know the ap directionality uh, we would actually approach uh, pretty close to that theoretical limit of the channel reuse we were going for uh, but the device spread itself um reduced that and what was okay, the peak so for like a single ap how many devices would be on one of those ap's and what kind of uh throughput and quality were, were those users getting great question 
So we had guys on site on many of the days uh, that we were testing and we played with quality of service and we played with load balancing. And so the answer kind of varies as we were going through and tweaking things. Um, some tweaks, you know, had very little change like uh, 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 airtime fairness and um, actually airtime fairness had a, a pretty good improvement, um, but we were doing uh, throttling as well, peak throttling. So on, on some games, we'd have users test and we'd just leave throttling off. And so, and so we'd have folks distributed around the stadium actually being able to get in excess of 50 megabit per second throughput. Uh, and eventually we throttled that down. So it was intentionally limited, I think, to 10 megabit per second. And we were able to hit that most of the time. Uh, and then we played with load balancing as well to see you know, how the system did when we just disabled load balancing and how the system did when we specifically enabled load balancing. So we actually did get to the point when we disabled load balancing just to see how natural load balancing was working, where uh, it revealed we did have an RF issue uh, where we were kind of under covering an area. And so at one point, we ended up in excess of 200 users on a single. It was actually an ACHD, um, it's, which is capable of that, fortunately. Um, and it, it turned out that it was uh, able to be heard by uh, way more users than we were expecting. So it was in a specific suite that then had some RF propagation characteristics where it really mm. kind of blasted out into the forum. Uh, and so we tuned tuned that down. Typically, uh, once we got everything tuned and load balanced, um, we were running somewhere around uh, 50 users, I think, um, typically max, uh, as the users would just balance out around the APs around can, them. Can you go into the load balancing feature? Like, how how do you load balance devices when devices typically pick which AP they want to connect to? That's a great question. Um, so with Unify, uh, by default, it's kind of like a, it's a soft load balancing. Uh, you can enable hard mode as well. Um, so it's just trying to nudge. Once you um, get over a certain limit, um, it'll reject association on one AP, so it'll it'll try to get to another AP. Um, and then if the you know poor device keeps coming back to that same AP, say uh, in the a case where you have load balancing enabled, and maybe this is an AP off in some peripheral wing, and it's the only AP that that um, the station can really hear, um, the AP will notice that and then let that device on. But other devices that happen to be able to hear other APs will kind of see that they got rejected, uh, do a quick scan, find another AP and get on. Uh, and so that's the technique that we use for load balancing. Uh, and overall, it, it seems to work pretty well. Um, you know, there's there's a trades with everything. Mm -hmm. The trade on this is maybe just a little bit slower association time. Yeah. Should you be one of the guys that's, you know, trying to get onto the network and, and you're going to onto an AP that's already full. Yeah, so it's got some intelligence. Uh, the AP has some intelligence built in where if it keeps rejecting uh, an association or a request to join there, it'll just allow it eventually. That's right. Okay. Um, and generally, um, despite doing that, uh, we haven't run into issues where APs end up overloaded. Uh, the only case we've seen where uh, an AP will end up overloaded in that case is specifically where your, your RF design is just really poor. Um, and so the stations just um, are correctly deciding that they need on that AP because there isn't any other AP in that area mm -hmm. to service them. Have you, have you guys done any measurements as to how long it would take to associate to the SSID uh, with the load balancing on versus it off? That's a great question. I don't think so. Jeff, do you know if we've done that? No, we didn't do that specific test. Okay. But yeah. I mean, from what I can tell, um, most of the users and, and we did, you know, some realist, like very uh, high level testing, testing. Mm -hmm. uh, we asked a bunch of different fans to give us feedback throughout the, uh, the game and stuff like that. And uh, the feedback was generally very positive uh, and it got better and better, you know, as the season went on and, and we t tweaked different things. And so I, I don't know of anybody that wasn't able to just get on the network at least right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, at least no one noticed it. So I think we had 30 guys sprinkled around who were running tests every either five or 10 minutes. Um, and then they would kind of like roam around and run a test again. Uh, so there were kind of our plants to um, to kind of give us additional like real world data uh, in addition to our uh, monitoring. And yeah, none of them brought that up. So yeah. I think I would think that least... that would be a, a good feature to add if it's not in there already is uh, how long it average time it takes to associate to the wireless network, uh, especially if you have load balancing on versus off. Because a, a lot of people will say don't do the load balancing because of the, 
the rejection of associations and 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 if you've got clients that are that just keep trying to connect it just becomes a yep. poor u- end user experience right agreed yeah i think that's a, a great statistic to have yeah for sure but but uh, i mean we have to remember we are in 2017 and uh, smartphones and devices are much better at finding a good ap than they used to be even a year or two ago so i mean i, I agree we should track it but uh I mean, smart device, smartphones are much better than they used to be, for sure. Generally, pretty quick. Do you have any questions, yeah. Francois? Yeah, I have a question related to um, you know a cap- the capacity of one AP and how much client can one AP handle. Uh, so Brendan talked about you know two hundred clients being connected. Um, is it like is it two hundred? Hundred active clients, or is it just two hundred associations? Uh, how did you, you know, how are you able to handle that many clients? And on on the website, it says that the ACHT can handle five hundred and fifty plus clients. Um, my question is, how did you test it, and did you also t- test the user experience when you have that many clients connected to one access point? That's a great question, and so this plays directly back into Andrew's tool. Um, so, like as you can explore in Andrew's tool. Um, you could take, you know, 500 MacBook Pros with 3x3 802.11 AC cards, and you can hook them to an ACHD. Uh, and we've actually done this with VeroWave, um, and then I think maybe 50 MacBook Pros, um, and hooked these uh, to an ACHD on 5 gigahertz, uh, and then run throughput tests, right? Um, and and so back to Andrew's tool, it all depends on the capacity of the client, right? Um, and so in the FedEx form example you referenced that where it was 200 devices on there, those are primarily one by one or two by two. So that was a bad thing. <laughs> that was something that you know we wanted to correct quickly in our RF design, the physical design, like I talked about in the form we did. And then that made it so we didn't have 200 users wanting to connect to an ACHD. Now back to the case where say you're servicing MacBook Pros and they're all in close range, uh, we've done that test and with our, uh, our HD, our highest capability. So it has the most powerful Wi-Fi radios that you can currently get on the market. And um, host processor, um, we were able to get over 800 megabit per second aggregate with uh, 500 MacBook Pro equivalents, 50 of which were actual MacBook Pros. So we could observe the user experience on that. Um, and then 450 of which were actually a combination of uh, VeroWave, which is an extremely expensive tool that allows you to emulate these things. Um, so the, the whole purpose of this tool is you can do that. You can get, with this really capable AP, you can get 800 megabit per second and a ton of clients, right? But that's really not a real world situation because once you start putting like an old 11G or 11N device, everything starts to fall apart, right? So that yeah, really just... With- Sorry, did you test with the 20 megahertz wide channels or 80 megahertz wide channels? In that case, it was 80 because we were okay. really we were yeah. testing that to see how our firmware the optimizations. Maximum. Yeah, yeah, so um, these these highest end radios, so they have these coprocessors on them. So they have main processors and coprocessors on the radio, on the host processor, um, and you know all the way to Ethernet. So the host processor is three code processors in addition to being, you know, a, a dual core processor itself for running application code. It's got uh, three processors that are network stream processors, one for each radio, and then it has a, um, a coprocessor for handling Ethernet. Um, and then the radios themselves have coprocessors for their stream traffic. And so there's a ton of work that goes into making all these coprocessors work with each other and then work with VLANs and work with radius VLANs and work with all these features and QoS and everything. And it really quickly just falls into this painful firmware mess. Um, and so a lot of vendors just punt on doing that. Uh, we didn't, um, it, and some could argue actually that that was a mistake that we didn't, um, but we get way better um, high capacity handling because we didn't punt on that. So the reason we did that test is we wanted to see one, um, you know, what is the total capacity of the system? Can it actually handle this? And then two, is it gonna like turn into a nasty crashing mess? Because that's mm-hmm. like the worst case and the timing of all these coprocessors working with each other. And it didn't, it actually worked great. And we were amazed to see how capable the AP can be when it has extremely capable stations. To my knowledge, the MacBook Pros are the most capable stations out there. The drivers seem very well optimized. Now you take that same AP, you cup, put a couple of 11G uh, stations on it, uh, and now you can only handle maybe two or three stations <laughs> at max throughput, right? Um, so you have this wide variance of what the AP can actually do based on the clients. And Andrew's tool does a great job of describing that. So the 500 um, user point, uh, we use the 
like association limit. And, uh, you know, for the sake of candor, we should probably be more clear on, uh, on what that limit is. So if you look at our like AC pro, we list that device as uh, being able to support, I think, 250 users or something. Uh, and that is uh, essentially the association limit. I think the association limit on that is like 287 or something. And the association limit on an ACHD is actually 500 users per band. Um, so each radio can associate 500 users. So you could put 500 MacBook Pros per band on an ACHD, which we haven't done because we don't have enough hardware to do that. Um, and so the total association limit of that HD product is 1,000 compared to an AC Pro, which is about 287. And what that speaks to is just um, really the capability of the radio and, and what the radio is designed to handle. Okay, so the difference That's between physics. both APs are the, um, the processors that you described earlier? Yeah, it's the processors and then the capability of the radio. So with the AC Pro, it's a 3x3 three three Wave 1 uh, and the radio has, you know, less RAM, lower processor speed. Um, in that case, it does have hardware offload, but only on the five gigahertz radio, 2.4 gigahertz does not, the host does not, ethernet does not on the, that's the AC pro. The HD has hardware offload for ethernet three times on the host, uh, which we use in, in forthcoming, uh, products, but we actually only use two of the hardware offloads cause we only have two radios. And then each of the radios has hardware offload and they're four by four. Uh, wave uh, wave to mu mimo. Uh, we actually use the same radio um, for five gigahertz as for two point four gigahertz. So the two point four gigahertz is is pretty overpowered. So uh, here's a question that I think people will ask. Right, you you have the FedEx form, and you, you may not be able to answer this, but just I'll put it out there. Uh, yeah, you, your APs can do. You say they can handle like five hundred associations. So why not do the five hundred per radio at the forum? So it's, it's again, Andrew's tool. Um, if people walked into the forum with MacBook Pros, um, then you could easily do 500. <laughs> um, but people aren't walking in with MacBook Pros. Uh, you have old cell phones, you have cell phones that are one by one. And so that just directly impacts the capacity. Uh, and so your question segues perfectly into using his tool. So you could actually go into the tool specify our ACHD, specify MacBook Pros, and you'll see the total capacity of the AP is much higher. Um, and then if you go in there and you specify, you know, a, a random smattering of modern to not modern, modern smartphones, the capacity of the AP goes significantly lower. Mm -hmm. um, and to supplement that, um, also in the forum, we're kind of, we've deployed not our most recent solution, and we're going to be working on deploying our, our most recent solution. So the AP that's in there has a, a we're only using five gigahertz, so it has an association limit and, and it's specced on the data sheet for that of around 120. Um, so the association limit of the APs in there alone uh, doesn't allow you to, to attack that, but mainly it's the capacity of the devices interplaying with the capacity of the APs. Now the future solution that we're doing, um, it's uh, a multi-radio multi, it's a multi um, with this controllable beam size effectively mm -hmm. uh, so you can make it spread almost like an omni all the way to being like pretty narrow like you know 30 degree cone um in that case you can actually get to the 200 or 300 user uh per ap now, now remembering that that those there are multiple radios in that ap so it's actually fewer uh and each radio is more capable so going forward uh yeah that is a solution that that you'll be able to do in the forum and, and we're looking forward to it because it greatly reduces uh, the maintenance and permutations of things that can go wrong because you can go from maybe you know 80 to 90 ap's installed to 20 or 30 mm -hmm. ap's installed yeah i can see that being used because if you've got an area of your your forum where everyone's sitting there you could you know direct that beam and then if you have an area where it's kind of sparse. There's not a lot of people sitting there. You could widen that beam and make that uh, association limit a little bit higher versus you know directing it to an area where there might not be people sitting. Precisely. And it allows for installation height too. So in some cases, maybe you have to install the AP 10 feet over the users and you still want to be able to cover 200 or 300 seats. So you need a much wider beam. Or in other cases, you need to install... 55 60 feet above the users and you still only want to cover 200 or 300 seats and so it allows you to do that with one product and you're not having to um, involve your purchasing logistics with your install logistics mm -hmm. you can pur purchase one product and then use mm -hmm. it in these variety of ways 
Yeah, the, the planning gets really difficult because I, I want to get into the power level tuning, right? So if you're going to have this antenna that can dynamic, you can dynamically change the beam with, you're effectively yep. changing your cell there and the reach of that signal. Uh, how, how much of that even affects that signal when you've got power level tuning involved as well? Right, that's a great question. And that's part of the reason we've invested um, both in this planning tool um, which helps to have these visualizations I talked about so you can understand what's going on to your network. And then also taking the tool and a lot of the, the thought that's been put into this tool over the years uh, to, to, to in combining that with some of the machine learning that we've done actually for our antenna design uh, to help with these kind of machine learning systems. So it turns out if you look at the the trade space, your your channel planning is actually the most difficult thing to do. So if, if you're... Um, what we do is it's um, if you look at like genetics, actually, if you look at evolution, you, that's the type of system that we're using. Right. So you randomly make these solutions of a channel plan and then you can look at the capacity of the system. And then you say you make 100 of these and you pick 20 and then you breed those all together and you make another 100 solutions. And then you have these figures of merit, which is the capacity, the overall capacity and the capacity of each AP. Um, so that actually converges a lot slower and is a lot harder to get right uh, doing your channel planning. So power selection and cell size converges a lot faster. Uh, so fortunately, adding this degree of freedom, which is controlling your cell size with, with RF beam pattern, um, doesn't add a lot of complexity and uh, to the solution. It's relatively intuitive and you kind of had to do it already um, the only difference now is instead of having to go back up on a ladder and reinstall a different uh, direct directionality uh, antenna uh, you can just do it as a software change mm -hmm. and how did you guys plan for the power are you guys having it dynamically change the power for the form dynamically change the power level or do you guys did you end up setting it statically uh, based on the plan that you guys laid out hey everyone Let's take a break to think about Wi-Fi for a moment. It's awesome when it works, right? But when it doesn't, the problem is usually a mystery. If you're sick of simply rebooting your devices and crossing your fingers every time your Wi-Fi goes down, let the Wi-Fi experts at MetaGeek make the invisible visible. Their powerful diagnostic solutions visualize interference from external Wi-Fi and non-Wi-Fi sources and will help you configure your wireless network for maximum coverage and throughput. From a weekend enthusiast to an enterprise IT professional, MetaGeek has everything you need to make Wi-Fi awesome and keep it that way. Check out their solutions at MetaGeek.com to take your first step towards awesome Wi-Fi because I use Channelizer to actually visualize the spectrum whenever I'm troubleshooting an issue that seems to be coming from maybe a non-Wi-Fi source, for example. And I've also used the Insider Office as a network scanner to figure out what wireless networks are in the area, what channels they're using, and which channels I should use. And just a little tip, you could also plug in your Wi-Spy DBX and use that with Insider Office to get some channelizer light, for example. You can see some spectrum analysis with Insider Office. When you have, if you guys are interested, take a look at metageek.com to see what you can do for your Wi-Fi network. That's a great question. Uh, so we looked at coupling data. Uh, we took surveys, the coupling data between the APs. So the higher you go on power, the more um, co-channel interference you're going to have from uh, you know one AP to the other AP using the channel. And so from that regard, you want to reduce the power. Um, but of course, you're going to get to lower MCS rates if you go too low. Um, so that's the balance that you're striking, is you want to have enough power in the cell that um, if possible, all the devices in that cell run at their highest capable MCS rate uh, for for two by two, assuming, um, while also minimizing the power so that you have less interference between your your cells, specifically the cells that are on the same channel. So we iteratively went through um, and and looked at this uh, and tuned the power you know as low as we could go to kind of help ourselves with channel reuse. Um, where we still thought that we would have adequate power um, for ensuring high MCS rates for the zones. Okay. And is there a capability for dynamic power changes there? Um, there currently is not. Uh, so it is statically set. Um, now, the, the work that's coming out, uh, again, all kind of out of this collaboration is what spurred it. Um, there will be a system for recommended 
uh, channel and then also recommended dynamic. Um, so it'll analyze the system for you. Um, so I guess not re recommended dynamic, but recommended power levels. Okay. So you can, you know, press in, uh, a button to analyze your network and then say, Hey, these are the channels that we're thinking. And here's the powers that we're thinking as well. And it'll kind of push those to you. And then you can, on this capacity plot, the capacity histogram, you can see how that actually impacts your system, at least as far as Unify has learned to understand your system. And then you could go in and, and manually tweak that as well and look at your capacity. Okay. And it was Daryl that did the the survey afterwards after the after the deployment. Yeah, it was a it was a big it was a big mess of guys. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have a, a variety of employees. Uh, so so Daryl's you could say was kind of like the quick brains behind things because <laughs> you know he can kind of jump into something and be like okay, you know here's here's all the stuff that you need to do because he's very familiar with Andrew's tools and has mm -hmm. kind of done this thing a bunch of times. So he was just kind of like the quick here you go, this is what you guys should be doing. And then we have a bunch of employees that actually live relatively close to the FedEx forum. Every one of them, you know, wanted a shot to go uh, have like free reign on the forum and walk around and take measurements <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> during, during and after games. Yeah. And so it was, it was kind of a mess of folks that would just go in and, and take some data. And, and most of the guys at the company are pretty familiar with Wi-Fi. So it was, um, you know, plenty capable to go do it. And of course, really, really willing to do so. Sure. Okay. So you got the the you have the wireless installed, deployed, and you have now users coming in. Uh, can you go into how you guys manage it now? Uh, how does how does the operators of FedEx Forum manage their Wi-Fi network and also identify any issues if there are any and and kind of mitigate that? It's a great question. Um, and at any point, Jeff, feel free to interject here. Um, so one of the one of the main things we look at is what is our top channel utilization. Um, so that shows you that represents a lot of things, right? So if you look at any of the Unify APs, so you can do these customized columns. You can set up the columns of data that you want to look at, however you want on the UI. You just go and drag and drop. Um, so there's channel utilization, memory utilization, CPU utilization, total throughput. Um, we would have a column for retries. Um, and then uh, maybe a couple other metrics. Uh, and then we just kind of sort and monitor those, right? Uh, so channel utilization is is one of the most important ones because it um, is kind of a sum of all sorts of other things that could be going wrong, right? So if you see your channel utilization popping way over what, uh, say, the capacity tool is telling you it should be, then uh, that could be indicative of too many retries, too many users on the AP, too much throughput on the AP, uh, so that was one of the first things that we would look at. Uh, so this column view of all the APs, and then you you sort. And actually, out of the effort, um, we realized it'd be really nice to have this like debugging view of your network. So you could actually have one page that simultaneously showed you the top five of of everything. So channel utilization, total throughput, mm, total. Okay. Oh, that was the other metric: uh, total number of users on the AP. And so we actually have that in Unify now. So you can go to this one page, and it has the top of all the metrics that you'd want to monitor um, in a in a high density environment. And they're also just fun to look at in overall uh, Wi-Fi installs. Yeah, because I'd be interested in a total number of retries. You know, which areas getting. A yep. lot of clients that are re having retry frames and try to figure out what that problem might be. And you say you, you now I don't use Unify, so uh, help me describe this a bit. But you you go into a dashboard. Is it a controller in the cloud management system? Right. Those are all good questions. So um, we have all of the options. <laughs> so we have a cloud system. So you can go to unify.ubnt.com at the upper right. There's like a I would like a cloud. Unify controller, you click that button, and then you can get a cloud controller. Um, uh, some of our customers, because we come from the like internet ser service provider industry, um, really don't want any of their stuff to ever be hosted outside of their own networks. Mm -hmm. um, so we support all sorts of permutations of local installs to their own cloud to data center. So our customers will install it in Docker containers, they'll install it on AWS, DigitalOcean. Um, and we also have little hardware appliances that you can get, whether it's a smaller capacity, maybe like 20 AP, 1,000 users, to bigger capacity where you could have thousands of APs on, on our hardware appliance. Um, so that's the whole gamut. You can install it on Mac, Windows, Linux. Uh, so you go into this interface, and in all, all of them, say you install it on your own AWS account or you install it on your Mac Mini, um, we have an optional service where you can say, you know, connect to my Ubiquiti account, and then if you do that, 
um, any number of controllers you have shows up on our, uh, uh, we call it our hybrid cr- cloud. So think of that like dynamic DNS connectivity back to wherever the thing is, but mm-hmm. uh, just automatically works. So it shows up, it gives you the status on unify.ubnt.com. You can tunnel into it from anywhere in the world. So you pull up this dashboard, uh, you can go to uh, devices view, go to APs, uh, and then you can, uh, on the upper right, you can customize the columns to be whatever you want. So we have like a recommended view of columns that shows, you know, all sorts of metrics that you'd imagine, including like retry accounts, channel utilization, number of clients, throughput, uh, up and down. And so you can go through and rearrange these columns however you want. Uh, and then that's what we'd typically do. So we had a saved customized column. Uh, so we would just click on devices and then you'd see all these metrics and you can sort by the metric you want. Um, and then in our current testing version, because this came out of the FedEx forum, you can go to statistics and then debugging metrics view. And this gives you um, really all the parameters that you'd see in the planning tool right there live on what's happening about your network. So you can see the top APs with retries. Uh, then you can click on that AP and then you can dig more into um, uh, what's causing the retries, mm-hmm. how many users it has, uh, what exactly what users are on it, what their fire rates are, all that sort of stuff. So you can really get drilled down into the actual AP and then the device and and get all those details. And now, is there any details you can't get from the web interface? Do, is there some sort of command line interface where you have you can run some you know extra debugging commands to get details or even uh, frame captures as an example? That's a great question. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, uh, actually Jeff would be a great person to talk to you this. Yeah. I mean, so there's a lot of new features that are, are coming out soon that will help with this right now. I mean, you can do TCP dumps and you can get frame captures at least on a layer two, uh, basis from all of our APs. Um, but we are working on, uh, on our up and coming models and, uh, we'll probably bring this to all our, our APs at some point is the ability to capture packets from, from any of our APs. And then uh, it'll actually filter that data back into the, the user interface and it'll show you, you know, kind of the, the airtime usage of all the packets. So say, for example, you just have one client that's one legacy client that's just eating up your airtime. Well, you, you would be able to see that right away visually. Um, so that's not available yet, but it is coming out. And uh, uh, same thing with, uh, I mean, for example, 2.4 gigahertz, you know, you have a problem where if you have a lot of APs all beaconing, beaconing at one megabit, I mean, you really can only have 20 or 30 before your uh, 2.4 gigahertz performance just uh, doesn't doesn't work anymore. And so those those tools are, are available. Our APs, you know, you can still SSH into them and you can, you can run low-level commands, um, but we're working towards, you know, being able to bring that all to the user inter- interface mm-hmm. so that it's more um, efficient for anybody to be able to get in there and do some of these diagnostics. Just talking about some of these statistics, um, you know, uh, when we would watch a game at the FedEx Forum, and we we watch the game just on the Unified Dashboard, um, we would look at, you know, the number of clients, the channel util- utilization. Another thing we'd look at is we'd go to the map. And the map shows you all the APs, you know, as they're spread out across the bowl. And we would look for APs that have, you know, for example, zero clients. And so some of those APs would be uh, APs that are on, you know, channel 144, some less compatible channels and stuff like that. And so uh, we would we would be able to make tweaks to the setup, the configuration, so that we could uh, balance things. And, you know, if there was a, we uh, limited the number of, you know, less configured, less uh, compatible channels in the bowl because of that. Uh, and kind of beefed up the channels around that so that uh, that area would still be covered. Uh, but yeah, you you can do that. Uh, some other things that I did is, you know, if I found that there was a, a an AP that was constantly high utilization on its channel, uh, you know, you can, you can SSH in and you can go to your router and you can like do an ARPing and just kind of figure out what the latency is to uh, that device. Um, but we are working on also adding uh, latency and Wi-Fi you know, basically time from the the uh, time that the packet gets queued into the radio to the time it's act, mm-hmm. uh, getting those statistics back. We don't have that quite yet, but that is, you know, another that's something that, thing that we, we, yeah, that's, we that's find really will like be very that. useful. Related to the same subject, I have a question uh, regarding support. Do you guys have a support team we can call if we uh, if we have a, a bug with an AP or like a, you know, AP firmware bug or a bug with the management software? Yeah, we yeah. do actually. Um, so we have our Unify Elite service. Uh, sorry if I cut you off there, Jeff. No, you're good. Uh, 
Um, so uh, Unify is all, uh, you know, it's all about, um, you know, disruptive pricing. So the, the way we've been able to accomplish that is we actually don't have a sales team at all. Um, and so that saves us a ton of money and we can sell our gear a lot lower. So, um, that's, that's one of the tenants that allows Are you saying us to sales, do that. salespeople cost too much? Is that the, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, long story short, uh, it, it can be pretty expensive, right? So you end up paying out a lot. Um, and so also we're forced to be more efficient because we don't have sales. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have to make the features like exactly as our community wants them. Uh, and it forces a connection between the engineers uh, and the community, um, it, like our users, that, that makes the whole system more efficient. So it's, it's not just the reduction, uh, like because we don't have to pay sales guys. Um, it's actually we, we get an efficiency uh, because the engineers now just directly interact with everyone, right? So mm -hmm. when, when people are having problems, like they're talking to Jeff, they're talking to me, like if you go on the community, you'll see Jeff and I all over the place, right? Feature ideas and Jeff will notice it or I'll notice it or one of the several other engineers will notice it. Um, and then we'll just go implement it, right? Um, so it makes it really satisfying for our users, makes it satisfying for us. And it also makes it more efficient because we're making what people want. Um, whereas you can have this you know, huge, huge sales deal um, and you make a bunch of features that are very specific to this one sales deal because it's worth a lot of money that might not be worth that much to the overall WLAN community. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of how we get some efficiency. Uh, we've got very rigorous hiring processes as well, um, which gives us more efficiency and that allows us to keep our costs down. So we're all about low cost. So now, is support uh, mainly, uh, just directly with the community or is there a, a plan people, a support plan or support contract that people get if they're going to deploy this into a stadium, for example? That's a great question. So traditionally, um, the understanding is, yeah, it's, if you need help from ubiquity, you go to the community, you talk to the engineers and they'll help you. Um, but that's limiting to a certain degree. And there are a lot of folks who want to deploy unify who couldn't because say they have a, they need to have an SLA that they'll have a vendor backed warranty for the lifetime of the gear for five years of the gear, or they need uh, phone support uh, with the vendor. Um, and so we made our system called unify elite exactly to address that. Um, and when we first announced it, uh, a lot of our user base um, were, were unhappy with us um, until they kind of came to grips on like what is elite and what is not elite. So we didn't want to make uh unify now this higher cost solution because mm -hmm. um, that would alienate a lot of our market. Um, it, traditionally, what you'll see is vendors either kind of integrating the sales cost and their support cost into the gear so it gets more expensive and then also charging a license. So we wanted to keep all the gear at the same price uh, so the folks who deploy it now the way they do doesn't impact them at all. But we wanted an option for these guys who say deploy a stadium or um, because they're a service provider and they need this sort of service contract to be able to have um, the same sort of support that they could get from other vendors with this more expensive gear. Um, so that's what we uh, introduced was Unify Elite. Uh, when you sign up for that, um, you get a cloud account um, that you can use or optionally not use. You can do Elite without cloud. Um, and talk to us about that um, if anyone's interested. Um, and that gives you, as long as you have the service, it's a yearly service, you have uh, advanced ship RMA as an option. Uh, you have upgraded support in that you're like auto escalated. Uh, you also have phone support. Um, you have cloud. Um, and then there's a couple other things I'm forgetting. So that's our way to address, um, say, uh, having the value that Unify currently has while allowing these folks who want to use Unify because of its burgeoning uh, features and its uh, cost point uh, and, and a lot of the things, a lot of the products that are coming, but may have these requirements on support or just needs for support and RMA and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, I want to jump back to the forum here. And one topic we didn't discuss yet, we briefly mentioned it was the antenna selection. How do you guys go into deciding uh, which type of antenna that you're going to use. Now, I know uh, with the pain points you guys ran into, you now are developing your own antenna uh, for, for your use case. But how did you guys go into the selection of the antenna and where it's going to be placed? Uh, can you go into that into more detail? Sure. Uh, Jeff, would, do you want to jump on that or do you want me to jump on it? Uh, I mean, I we, we've also partnered with a, another stadium uh, you know, here in Utah, uh, and we just use the same antenna 
all over the place there. And so I, there's definitely things that we're learning. I know that the FedEx forum is a little bit more intentional. Um, so Brandon, if you don't want to, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Yep. Uh, so, um, it, it's all about kind of like we talked about with our antenna, right? So, um, you're looking at the distance from, uh, from the AP to the client, you're looking at how many seats there are, and then also the geometry, right? So it comes down to really this like trig problem. Um, so you're trying to cover um, only a specific area, uh, and you're selecting an antenna antenna beam width that covers that area. And so that was done iteratively through the form. And like I mentioned, we did it wrong several times. <laughs> and you install, you realize you're covering too large of an area. Um, and maybe you don't have the power controls necessary uh, to, to bring that all the way back in because because you ended up with way too high gain or you ended up with uh, uh, too, too wide of a beam width. Uh, so it's, it really comes down to like a trade and planning problem of how you're going to design your cell sizes. Uh, and then the form kind of as, as Jeff alluded, um, we ended up with a variety of um, beam widths and gains, but they really weren't uh, they weren't huge. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, there were there were parts where um, we really did have to kind of deviate, um, and those were the more painful points where we we thought we could get away with one gain or another, um, and then you actually set it up like I mentioned before, and you end up with way more users than you should have on an AP because of the propagation, um, the propagation environment, and so then you had to go back up there. Either you swap that out to have a different beam width, or if possible, uh, tweak with your power control. Uh, to to discourage um, that many users getting on the AP, uh, so it ended up being a pretty iterative process. Uh, we're mm -hmm. working to improve that and unify. Um, not not for stadium yet, so it's not a point where uh, we have a, you could enter like a 3D model of a stadium and, and do all your beam patterns in a visual way. We're working to get there. Uh, right now, what we do have is is a two dimensional um, predictive coverage. So that's in our testing release as well. So that comes out in September. Um, and what that allows you to do is, you know, import, import a floor plan, um, uh, draw in all the walls, specify the materials, and it'll give you an estimate of, of what your coverage is going to look like based on what you put in. And what we'd eventually like to do is make it so you don't have to do this hand trig, right, to figure out um, how the RF is going to project onto your surface. Uh, the tool that we're using for this 2D predictive coverage is actually a three-dimensional engine. Um, so it is capable of, of doing this uh, predictive coverage over a 3D area. Um, there's just a lot of extra work that the UI team needs to do to make it so you could actually like import 3D models and project properly and all the corner cases that can occur. So it'll get a lot easier. Uh, right now, it's just kind of an analytical problem of, of mm -hmm. doing trig and, and figuring out uh, uh, planning for a you know, certain power level over a certain area projected down, you know, say, onto rows of seats. Yeah, I think that's great because you, you guys have mentioned it again and again um, as we're talking is the amount of testing you guys are doing, the optimization, you guys are doing surveys, you've had a lot of people coming in there and, and testing it, even getting down to talking with users there and finding out, okay, what kind of issues are you running into or is it is it working for you? So you guys right. are doing everything across the board, which... Um, which I think is great. I think that's a great way to do it versus just doing a, you know, a predictive plan and kind of AP on a sticks type stuff and then validating it afterwards. You guys go throughout the whole process or are validating it. So I think that's great. Yeah, and a lot of the reason for that is we want to learn uh, what our users have to do. And a stadium is a pretty demanding environment. Um, so as we force ourselves as engineers to try to make this right, um, we can learn, okay, man, it would be super useful if the firmware did this, or it would be so amazing if the UI had this. Um, and so we have most of the things that we've learned from the FedEx forum are now tools that uh, we either have released in a testing release, some are in a stable release, um, or we're, we have actively in development right now, whether that's a hardware product, firmware, uh, backend, say like our uh, machine learning that, that we actually, I got a demo this week, which was, it was really cool to see um, all the way to, you know, our UI, say this um, histogram of capacities and stuff like that. So that's why we were so hands-on is uh, we want to see where are the inefficient points for our customers? Cause we want to make this as, as pain-free as possible for them as efficient as it can be for such an environment um, and make the tools to enable them. So we've got a lot of those in the works now as a result of us, you know, yeah. going out and experiencing the pain firsthand. Now, how do you guys tie in security into this whole platform? So I, I could talk a little bit about that. Um, so we've had, uh, 
I mean, security has al- always been important, but uh, we were recent, recently approached by the uh, NCSC, which is the, is the uh, British Cybersecurity Council. Kinda. And so what they do is they go to different uh, hardware vendors, networking vendors, you know, router switches, access points, and they, uh, they kind of do a job interview with them. And they kind of just see what their processes look like, um, how important security is to them as an orga- organization. And honestly, I mean, they, they, they've told us that they've been to some vendors and some vendors, you know, they, uh, <laughs> they, they get it and some vendors uh, definitely do not get it. And so uh, we at least got the okay from the NCSC. And, uh, you know, we talked about our processes on uh, code release and, and things that go into the builds and how we make sure that the, things are secure and what kind of pen testing we sponsor. And, uh, so, you know, we use, we use the, uh, hacker one, uh, bug bounty program. And, uh, we, we try to make sure that uh, people feel like, you know, that they're appreciated and, and valued. And, uh, we have a lot of pen testers and researchers that we work with directly. And, um, you know, our, our round trip time on, uh, when, when a, a security issue comes up, typically, has been you know fairly quick. We can get uh, bug fixes in and and fix large security issues within a matter of. Uh, I mean, I, our most recent one, you know, it was like a day and a half or so, and so we were able to release it into alpha and beta, you know, within a week, and then uh, and then the issue was was gone. And so uh, because of some of these processes that we've we've got in place, um, you know, the NCSC at least is is saying that. Uh, they agree with the, the trajectory that we have, and um, and that's really important because you know if, if you don't have security on your network, uh, I don't know, it, it just doesn't give you a warm fuzzy feeling, mm-hmm. and so we we feel that it's very important to make that a, a high priority for our devices as well as our controller. Cool, and for the the Wi-Fi there at the forum is is it all open? It's an open SSID for everyone to join, and then. Do you guys have like a security appliance that just monitors that traffic for anything that might be uh, required to block or, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it is just totally open right now. Uh, You know, I'm not saying it'll always be that way, but it is the most convenient way, at least for guests to get online. Mm -hmm. Of course, all of the controller and the APs, everything, all of that is protected um, and, and monitored. And so um, we, you know, we continue to work on security as well. Um, you know, we're investigating, you know, whether or not to look into security products ourselves, uh, as far as, uh, being able to monitor and, and find, uh, malicious activity or malware on the network. And so uh, we're definitely looking into being able to, uh, roll that out to our customers as well. Is your is your security appliance uh, able to do URL filtering or deep packet inspection, or is it just a layer four stateful firewall? No, it, so, it'll do. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you go ahead, uh, Jeff. Yeah, definitely. We we uh, want to do deep packet packet inspection um, as well as URL filtering. I mean, um, we we want to be uh, you know industry standard. We want to follow not just follow, but uh, lead as far as the industry standards go um, in the, the in uh, implementing our security. And to speak to the current features, so um, in the forum right now, we're actually running our, uh, our 10 gigabit router, uh, which is our uh, Edge Router 8. Uh, it's XG, like remember like OS, you know, OS 10, OS X, so it's, it stands for 10 gig. Mm-hmm. Um, and that has uh, deep packet inspection and, uh, and in fact, uh, blocking in it. So you can go into DPI categories in the forum. And, and actually, I focused, or we've all focused uh, mainly on, uh, you know, the Wi-Fi tuning because there's an IT department there that, you know, runs all the security and everything. So I d- actually don't know the settings that they have uh, for deep package, packet inspection blocking on that. Um, and then in Unify, we have uh, deep packet inspection visibilities. So you can see, you know, who's looking at YouTube, who's looking at stuff they shouldn't be looking at. Um, and you can go into all these various categories and it'll actually tell you exactly. So you can look at social media, see who's the top user on social media, and mm-hmm. you can actually look at YouTube and all this stuff. 
And in that, that testing release, so we've had in testing now blocking on Unify as well. We use a little bit of a different system than what's used in the edge router. So it's taken a bit longer to get the blocking out. Um, it's more sophisticated and has a better history system to it. Um, not to throw edge router under the bus, but we're a managed system. So we have the capability to store a lot more statistics mm-hmm. and do a lot more analytics. Uh, so in that testing release, you can go in and, and say block um, social network or um, tunneling technologies. So you could block all tunneling technologies. And I don't currently know if this is done in the form, but the capability exists to do it on our hardware that's deployed there. Uh, so you can make sure that no one has the capability to tunnel out of the form and then say do something nefarious somewhere else having tunneled through public Wi-Fi. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is, uh, like I said, in testing in Unify, and then that'll be out, I think, September 4th is our planned release. Um, and a fun story on that, I actually, I wanted to do a blind test, you know, like the Pepsi and Coca-Cola, like blind taste <laughs> test. So I actually, uh, through this cloud interface, unify.ubnt.com, I went ahead and uh, got into my home controller and I saw my wife was streaming uh, Netflix. So I went ahead and disabled all social. <laughs> and then I texted her and, uh, and I was like, hey, tweak some Wi-Fi settings. Everything working OK. And she's like, yeah, all the rest of the Internet's working. But my friends on Netflix just stopped. And I was like, all right. And so I turned it back <laughs> on. I said, OK, I, I think it'll be good now. And she's like, oh, yeah, it's streaming again. So that was uh, you know, satisfying to see it work right away and you know, using the whole stack of our technologies through cloud connectivity and everything. But you know, felt a little bad. <laughs> well, um, one thing I wanted to to help wrap up on the on the FedEx forum stuff is uh, would you guys be able to provide any statistics uh, like screenshots or something that we could put on the show notes for people to see? Yeah, that would be fantastic. We'd love to do that. So we've got okay. a catalog of the screenshots and such and capacity. Uh, and so we can uh, throw that over to you. And then one of the features we didn't get to talk to too much is this like airtime utilization breakdown sorry breakdown that's coming on our our new devices so like this uh, stadium specific product i told you about mm-hmm. and then all of our next generation products have a dedicated security and spectral radio uh, we also forgot to talk about that during security as well um, so the purpose of that radio um, is for doing analysis on your network that's non-disruptive and then also looking out for security so to back up to security first um, it can say do a real time rogue AP detection, um, which is really useful for like banks and hospitals and such, where uh, you might have a war driver trying to make a rogue SSID and then s- steal some radius accounts. Mm-hmm. Um, so it looks out for that and alerts you right away. Um, and then for uh, the forum, it's really useful because you can do a real time breakdown of what is using your airtime. So it'll show you in this nice graph um, what APs are using the airtime. Uh, what rates all and then the breakdown of what users are using that airtime and then what rates are being used and actually what data at what rates so you can get this nice nice uh visualization and so it the reason i bring this that up is it'd be fantastic we've got a little video of that and it's gonna be in our beta form too but it, it might get more exposure if you know we we share that because uh, that's going to be a, a very useful tool for uh stadium deployments and that's coming on all the the products that we recommend so we could share both these statistics and then also kind of the the what's to come to make this whole thing easier. Yeah, that'd be cool. So, I'd be interested in seeing that. Will you be able to detect non-Wi-Fi interference with this new uh, Spectrum chip? Yeah, exactly. And actually on the demo, um, one of the things you can hit is uh, um, whether you show uh, non-Wi-Fi interference as well. So it, it shows you a total breakdown and you okay. have check boxes to show, well, you have to select one of them. One is APs, then you can select stations, then you can select data. And then it'll show you all three. And as you select more things, the graph's just getting more complicated. And then uh, you can select interference as something to show, and then free airtime as something to show. And the, the reason for that is you can see the you know the section maybe of like 20% interference, which is either non-Wi-Fi interference or frames that are so mangled by other interference that they're non-decodable. So you can't, uh, you can't decode the frames. Uh, and then you can see free airspace. And the, the reason for having this visibility is if you disable both those, then you can just see exactly um, at the distribution using the full plot width, right? Um, showing you, you know, what is the decodable frames on your network. So it does give you a breakdown of the decodable frames, the interference, which could be microwaves and stuff like that. And we do actually have classification for that. It's not running in this version, but we have classification. Um, and then also your free airtime on the plot. 
Oh, that's great. That's great. It looks it looks like you guys are adding a lot of enterprise grade features to your product. Uh, so the question now is: Is the price of the AP will like will the price increase? That's a great question. So um, along with this Unify Elite, so our, our whole uh, our whole model is you know we still want to support uh, this huge user base, and in fact, I think we're doing a way better job of supporting this big user base of disruptive pricing than we've ever done before. So like you look at our UAP AC in wall, it's a a dual band AP for hospitality, um, it's dual band 11 AC, uh, you know, dual radio, it can support 280 users or whatever. It's gigabit ethernet. It's got dual gigabit ethernet out the bottom one with POE and this thing's $99, right? Um, so it's kind of like we've told people that price and it's kind of a ridiculous price. Um, but it's our way of saying like, you know, we are committed uh, to having this extreme value for the price. Now, uh, we are going to make APs as well that are, uh, that are extremely performant um, that are more expensive, but it's still going to be this kind of ratio metric thing where you look at like our AC in wall and you compare that to other vendors of the same specs or maybe even lesser specs and we're a third the price. You look at our AC HD, which is $349. It's the same performance as APs that are $1,200. Uh, and now we're going to be making APs that... Uh, uh, at least publicly released, I think one may have just came out that that really just didn't exist in terms of performance capability. So these are going to be more expensive, but their competitors would be on the order of still three times more expensive. So we're continuing our pricing model, um, and the kind of the rule of thumb if you're comparing it to the industry is is about a third the price. Mm-hmm. But we're making we're going to make a whole suite of devices that are just incredibly more powerful, um, but still extremely disruptively priced. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's going to be interesting to see, especially with all these new features that you're adding, which are will be comparable to the other vendors out there. So with uh, that and the co- and integration of Andrew's co- capacity planner and yep. being able to get that into a web interface, I think you guys are actually developing a really solid solution here. Thanks. Actually, yeah. we didn't get to talk about the web interface too much, so maybe, maybe we should circle back to that. But uh, go ahead, Francois. No, I was going to say, um, you know, how I see it, correct me if I'm wrong, but because the product is cheaper than, you know, the competition, the people buying it and installing it, installing your equipment might not have the same level of Wi-Fi knowledge as, you know, uh, the people, you know, installing Cisco or Ruban. So, so they might not, you know... Um, uh, do it the the proper way all the time, and so mm-hmm. the the way the 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 fact that you are you guys are doing more, uh, you know, education with uh, you know with Andrew's capacity planner and and this type of stuff and integrating more enterprise grade features in your products, uh, I think it's it's a good idea. It's a good way to do it. Uh, do you have any other plans on educating? Uh, the you know the people the engineers installing your solutions. Do you have like training programs, or do you have anything other in mind that you guys are thinking about? Right, those are all fantastic questions. So let's see if I can remember all the answers that I've been queuing up. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I think is going to be really cool, a- Andrew stresses this a lot on his blog, is the capacity planning tool should be used in conjunction with um, you know a, say like a predictive RF model, so you know. Uh, because your your limits can be capacity of the AP as convoluted with the clients, and it can also be range at times, right, if you have like a really spread out campus. So you have to plan both right for your network to work right. And so our, our idea with Andrew's tool is to make it so you can intuitively um, do both of those. Um, and we want to make the tool easy to use so that using the tool itself, it'll actually like uh, kind of teach you the things you should be paying attention to. Um, and hopefully, uh, as long as the student is diligent, uh, they'll, they'll really learn some things from just using the tool, which is already the case using Andrew's tool. If someone sits down and learns this tool, they learn a ton about how you should do capacity planning, right? So the idea with this web interface is to actually have, uh, say, like a map view. And you could draw out blankets of, say, if you know that it's going to be monotonic, you can draw out a blanket. This is going to be an iPad 4 or what have you. Draw it out over an area, and then the software will use both uh, the predictive coverage and all this, also the capacity planning, knowing the capability of the device and uh, it, taking the device capability and the signal strength that you're going to have uh, you know, across this whole blanket of devices. Imagine a classroom and you're drawing it over the seats. So there's going to be an iPad, iPad in each seat and you say that it's you know, 50 iPads spread around this area. 
Uh, and so then that will show you um, how many APs you need and you know what the system capacity is going to be and all that stuff. So that should really educate people on, on what matters. Uh, as to training, uh, so we want to use, when we build this tool, uh, we do have training now. So you can go uh, do Ubiquity training and, and teach you about all sorts of capacity planning and, and all of these things. Uh, but it's very traditional and it's very, you go in the classroom and, and some people uh, love that, right? So that will continue. But some people are just never going to, you know, fly to Orlando to be trained, right? Or fly somewhere to be trained. They just want to do it on the web interface really quick and learn as much as they can. So what we're hoping to leverage off of this tool is actually to build scenarios. So you can imagine you tell someone uh, in the training, okay, you need to build this school system to support, you know, 1,200 users. Here are the variety of devices. Here's approximately where the devices will live. Some of these devices will roam. And you can actually walk them through using this online tool based on Andrew's system mm -hmm. um, and interactively showing them what matters, how many APs you need, where they need to place them, and walking through all this. And then you can make tests as well to say, okay, well, you've done this design, and now you have intermittent connectivity that's kind of in this realm. And so then you can show them, okay, look at the data rates, look at how many users are on the APs with that data rates and their average throughput, um, and they should be able to figure out, okay, so uh, we have these you know, slower, older devices on here, and that's actually why we're running out of airtime, right? Look at the airtime utilization. Mm -hmm. So that's our plan on expanding uh, training so that these guys, uh, Andrew said it very well as like, you know, these are just regular admins. It's regular admins who aren't going to fly somewhere to be trained um, can go through this program quickly and efficiently and, and try to make it as low barrier to entry as possible mm -hmm. um, to, to learn what matters and actually get good at making their systems work well. And then also alert in the Unify controller, you know, when these things happen and that plays into these features that we're making. So you could actually just alert the admin to say, hey, you have too many low rate devices on this AP you're probably going to have performance issues. Awesome. Man, that's great. Yeah, well, so, I mean, I just want to speak to some of these, uh, so, uh, this as well. I mean, so uh, Robert, our CEO, he, he talked to me a little while ago, and he was just saying how, like, a lot of uh, uh, IT integrators, you know, several years ago, they would say, um, they would think that Unify was kind of a joke before because, you know, it didn't have all these features and the performance wasn't there, but... Um, what we're hearing lately is that a lot of IT integrators, um, at least around here and, and some of the big names around here, um, you know, they're actually recommending Unify in all of their installations or, or at least most of them. And so things are really uh, going well for Unify. And, and uh, a lot of people who use some of these advanced features, you know, uh, we've made some tweaks in the UI so that, you know, the average person, just like Brandon was saying, can go in and, and find some of these insights and figure out, you know, what needs to be tweaked in their network. But as well, uh, we have all the advanced features and, and we just hide them under the advanced feature option. And so if you want to use some of these things like min RSSI and, and different mm -hmm. TX powers and different things like that, you can. Um, but we don't necessarily want people to shoot themselves in the foot right, know, that yeah. easily. And you, it's easy to reset have, things back to the, a default state. You, you need but, to have at least the education, the, the knowledge of what those features do. So I, I see why you guys want to hide that at least. Um, yeah, and so we try try to kind of put that in the UI as well. So we have several different explanations. You know, if you you probably should change this feature because of you know this reason or, or whatever, and mm -hmm. we try to put that training kind of into the UI as well. Okay. All right. Well, we're approaching an hour and a half. This is a long episode, but it's a lot of good uh, content. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to try to wrap things up here for for the listeners who um, are probably on the road listening to this and thinking, "Okay, I'm getting to my destination." Um, where where can people find find out more about Unify and and you know get a hold of this equipment? Great question. So um, to just play with the interface, which is one of the barriers to entry, right? You're used to your your own WLAN manager interface or, or you know what have you. Uh, we actually have demo.ubnt.com, so it's just demo in front of our website. Um, and so you can go in there and, and poke around at a lot of the features. There are some features that were pretty costly for us to implement that we don't have in there. But for the most part, you can see what the Unify experience is like. You can change settings. You can you can turn on advanced settings that lets you turn on band steering and then RSSI and all this and hard min RSSI for cell size tuning and all this stuff. Um, so you can go in there. Um, and familiarize yourself with the interface, uh, which we're quite proud of. We spend a lot of time, uh, you know, 
trying to make that intuitive, trying to make it discoverable so things just work. And it makes it clear what your steps should be um, if, if you need to do more advanced things. So that's, uh, I'd say, step one, check out demo.ubnt.com. Um, our gear is really inexpensive. Um, so if you want to give it a try, um, you can buy a cloud key. That's one of the hardware appliances that I mentioned earlier. Uh, that runs Unify up to maybe 20 APs, 1,000 users. So a decent sized site, actually. Um, so those are great for small hotels, for example. You can buy a cloud key. You could buy an AC Pro. Uh, it doesn't set you back too much. Uh, buy a Unify security gateway. You can get this DPI uh, look into your network. Um, and then you can buy one of our, say, lower port count switches. Our eight port switch, the lowest end model is uh, $99. Uh, has PoE out, uh, one port PoE out. Uh, Fun fact, it can be PoE powered as well with pass through, which is kind of cool. So you could buy this stack of a cloud key, uh, uh, Unify Switch 8, uh, USG, um, and an AC Pro, and maybe you're back $400. So the price of like a gaming router. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the whole Unify stack, and you can go through all the features that exist on Unify on this stack. Um, then you know you can do Radius VLAN. The USG has Radius server built in. You can play with Radius hotspot off the USG. You can connect to our cloud. You can do a deep pack packet inspection. You can mess with your wife and block YouTube. Um, <laughs> all that stuff. So, oh, that's that's a uh, you you might end up on the couch there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, I was working late last night because I was trying to wrap up some stadium stuff. Uh, coincidentally, and one of the one of our engineers, I mean, back end engineer, he saw on the channel that I played that prank on my wife, and he came by and he was like, "Oh, I see, I see, you don't want to go home." <laughs> <laughs> also, I also wanted to point out we have uh, design.ubnt.com, which kind of helps you. You kind of put in your wireless stations that you have. It's it's a very very basic. Uh, version and it doesn't have any of Andrew's features in here yet, but I'm I'm guessing that maybe we'll carry some of that over into this uh, design network planner, mm -hmm. and yeah. and it can tell you kind of what uh, kind of a stack setup you need in order to uh, implement a network, a Unify network. Awesome. Yeah, so that's like kind of the most basic you can imagine. Yeah. The, the whole thing that was intended for is like to tell people like, what is the Unify stack? Like, what parts should I be buying here? Because Ubiquity sells tons of stuff in general, mm -hmm. so that just kind of it tells you like, okay, you'll need a security gateway, a switch and an AP. And maybe you would want a cloud key for your small install. And we want to just completely replace design.ubnt.com based on everything we talked about here, um, integrating, you know, Andrew's tool uh, into the web with this map view. So it can be all inclusive. Uh, and then the challenge for us is we do have people who use design.ubnt.com just for these really basic installs where you don't need that much sophistication. So we're going to try to keep it easy for those guys. Okay. And, and Andrew, you've been quiet. <laughs> Are you still there? Yep. Sorry, I'm still here. All right. Where, where can people find out more about Capacity Planner and more about what you do? Yeah. So uh, everything is on my blog at revolutionwifi.net. Um, there's a, a Capacity Planner uh, page on there linked right from the top of the, the web page, as well as um, if you want to learn more and, and hear more background around uh, the tool or how I use it or just some of the, the technical fundamentals around it. Uh, go to the videos page on my blog. I've got uh, videos from past presentations as well as, um, you know, you can see the history kind of going back. There's even old videos from three three years ago or, or more that, uh, you know, where I started kind of evolving this idea of what eventually turned into the capacity planner. So a lot of good background information up there. Yeah, and I've seen oh. the video, so they're they're very good and inf informational and educational. So I, I highly suggest people to check those out. I, mean, I, I never watch them. I, it was so horrible watching. Them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hey, you know, I never yeah. listen to my episodes. <laughs> yeah, I'm terrified to listen to this episode. Actually, so shout out to the tool. Um, so it also does the SSID overhead calculator, no, uh, right. which Jeff was mentioning, and that's so useful for our customers. Uh, and you know, shout out to Andrew as well. Like as engineers, we had used your tools on many occasions. So when we got the opportunity to be introduced to you and then to collaborate with you, we were super excited because we had been hoping and discussing discussing that for a while. And so we're planning on integrating the SSID overhead calculator as well as part of the tool um, because that's so educational, especially to those guys that want to put 16 SSIDs so they can, you know, market <laughs> it all they can advertise for all these businesses and they're doing, you know, one megabit per second beacon and, and then they come onto our forms and, you know, wonder why stuff doesn't work. Oh wow. <laughs> 
Well, it's great to hear how uh, the capacity planner is is um, you know, going through this evolution now being brought into a web interface uh, that's accessible. I mean, web interface like on a website for planning and seeing that um, brought in to unify. I think that's great. And I think that's great for you too, Andrew. Um, it's good to see how this is uh, growing for the industry. Yeah. I mean, my tool is, you know, really probably the target market is just awareness and, and expert use for people who, you know, are really in the, the Wi-Fi community. Um, but to, for the broader reach, I think, you know, partnering with Ubiquity has been exciting for me and, and developing it into a, like a web-based tool that has a uh, broader reach is, is fantastic. I can't mm-hmm. wait for it. Yeah. And I think you've been probably waiting for that for a while, right? Or trying to get to yeah, that I, point. I, I mean, I talked with several companies about the idea, just hadn't found a, a good fit, but uh, this one seems to be the right the right place for it awesome cool i can't wait for the web version of it yeah me too yeah us too (laughs) awesome well i think that comes to an end here and if if there's anything else that you guys want to mention like where can people follow you online if if you're on social media yeah so um ubnt is our uh twitter handle and i'm actually on twitter as well because we'd get guys tweeting us for support (laughs) so (laughs) i'm ubnt dash brandon so it's just ubnt dash my name um, so you can hit me up with questions there and specifically on the framed IP address and radius accounting, we do support that now. So if you need that, hit us up on the forum. Uh, we've actually done multiple iterations now with several customers. So I saw that that was one of the questions for the podcast. Awesome. And Andrew's at, uh, I think that's revolution, just revolution Wi-Fi, right? Yep. On yep. Twitter at, at revolution Wi-Fi. Cool. Uh, and then I, I'm not so active on Twitter, but uh, on the community, I'm UBNT Jeff. All right. Make a note of that. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you guys for joining us for the show. Uh, there's a lot of good content and it's a lot of good information for me as I get more familiar with Ubiquity. So hopefully I can get a, um, a chance to actually deploy this and see it for myself, but or maybe even check out the FedEx forum uh, whenever I, I get around to that area and, and there's a game, but yeah, appreciate you Absolutely. guys coming on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. This was another great Clear to Send episode. If you enjoyed the podcast, please feel free to share it with your friends and coworkers. If you would like us to speak about a specific topic, please feel free to reach out to us on Twitter at clear to send In the meantime, have fun making Wi-Fi great again. Thank you again for listening. See you guys next week for a brand new episode of 